was amazed at the education it actually gave me. And the thing about entrepreneurs is we can name drop famous people. We can name drop locations. We can do all of that. But for as much that we are different, we're also incredibly similar. Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. All right, everyone. Well, question for you. If you had all the resources and all the time in the world and had something on your wish list, your bucket list, whatever, what would it be and how would you make it happen? Well, my guest today is known as the man that can, and he is Steve Sims, the author of the book, Blue Fishing, which I just ordered on Amazon. And what he's known most for is being a concierge to people like Richard Branson, Elon Musk. You want to get married in the Vatican. He can make that happen. And uh, I don't think my husband would want to do that. So I won't be calling you about that. But the, the reason he's here is because he's extraordinary. And I'm so excited to have him here. He's been featured in Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine. And my favorite fact is that twice he has spoken at the Pentagon and Harvard, and they probably need him at the Pentagon uh, lately. So with that, Steve Sims, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. That's quite a build up. <laughs> I got to ask you, how do you go from being a bouncer in a Hong Kong nightclub to being a billionaire concierge? <laughs> and which know, nightclub was it? Just in case I was there and you had to kick me out. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I wouldn't have kicked you out. Um, it was actually a club called Neptunes. Um, and if anyone remembers Neptunes from the, uh, the late 90s in Wang Chai, Hong Kong, then you were a devious individual. But um I, I ended up working there because I talked my way into a job when I was living in London. I talked my way into a stockbroker's position uh, in, when they were doing this uh, transfer of like about 60 or 80 people. And I got swept into that. And I lasted one day before they realized that I never had any qualifications or any ability in the stockbroking world. And I was down on my luck. I was feeling dejected. I had tried to make something better of myself and failed and I was drowning my sorrows outside this nightclub in Wan Chai when the owner of the club said to me you know we'll pay for your drinks if you kick these people out and I was like sounds a fair exchange for me because I'd already racked up quite a bar tab you know and um so I did that and I thought being the doorman of this club that was my lowest point um mm -hmm. I was amazed at the education it actually gave me. And the thing about entrepreneurs is we can name drop famous people. We can name drop locations. We can do all of that. But for as much that we are different, we're also incredibly similar. And I think if you've got 10 entrepreneurs together, and I, I please pray no one does this, but if you cut them all in half, I reckon you'd find that there was a gene or a DNA that was identical, some kind of cell or some, I don't know, extra kidney or something that we all shared. Because you can stick entrepreneurs in a room and we unite. There's something about us that enables us to relate. I noticed as a doorman, people. I noticed that people were celebrating a contract, a get together, a, a uh, date night. You know, they hadn't met since school. And I got to see all these different bouquets of people and style and reasons. And from there, I thought to myself, there's rich people here. I want to hang out with rich people. And at the time, what did the rich people wanted to do? They wanted to go to the parties. They wanted to go to the opening of a nightclub. They wanted to go to a private pa a party in the mansions. So I became pre-Google the oracle of all nightlife. <laughs> and my job was to find out where are the parties. Now, I was a pretty good doorman. And I was pretty good because I managed to get people out without fighting. And yeah. I would literally just walk up to someone and go, look. And I'm a big fella. I'm 250 pound of ugly. And for any of you that are listening to this and can't see me, not quite looking like Brad Pitt. So, you know, I was always the guy that would walk up to you and go, look, the boss has asked me to kind of like, you know, 
escort you out. I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want us to wrestle. It's going to mess up my night. It's going to mess up my shirt. So any chance I could ask you politely just to leave and then see you here again tomorrow night, we're all good. And I noticed if you push people into a corner, no matter how small they are, they only have one way to come back and that's attacking. So if you give people an option to get out of something while still maintaining that pride, that face in front of their friends, nine times out of 10, they took it. So I became really good at being able to cool things down and getting people to leave without actually fighting, which means that I actually got to become the doorman for some really cool parties. So as I started to become this doorman that knew where all the parties were, I focused on rich people and I did it as what I classed even then as a Trojan horse. As a broke bricklayer from England, I knew what it was like to be poor. I wanted to be in a room full of rich people because I wanted to understand what was it like to be rich? What did you do differently? What did you see? How do you act? How do you relate? And that was how it started. As the doorman, I started working for rich people at first just to give them a bit of a better nightlife. And I went from throwing private parties in Hong Kong to working with Ferrari in Monaco and Sir Elton John for his Oscar party and the Grammys and the New York Fashion Week and the Milan Fashion Week and Cartier in Stade. And over 25 years, just happened to be involved with some pretty spectacular people and events. I love that story. And being able to dissolve the situation and to make a person feel special, which clearly is, is a gift and an art that you've learned. I miss what Hong Kong was. I had many oh, yeah. times in Hong Kong. Um, can you say anything in Cantonese? No, I absolutely can't. I used to be able to, but uh, basically all I used to be able to do was ask for my bill and say thank you. And those were the only two things uh, that I used to be able to do. But no, it was Hong Kong was a different time. Um, I was there for the early 90s. I left in 95, moved down to Hong Kong, over to Monaco, over to Palm Beach, and I'm now here in Los Angeles. So um, Hong Kong was very, 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 very different before the, uh, the hand back to China rule. Definitely. I, I, um, I grew up, my, my dad was Chinese Canadian and I was raised by a very strict father and grandmother. And I had to go to Chinese school on Sunday, Steve, Ooh. and my family is Cantonese. And so well, the first time I went to Hong Kong for business, I've probably been there about 16 times. Um, I only, I can order food and I can count and I can swear. And that's all I can do. But one night we go out, I can't even remember. We go out with a bunch of people. And you know, in Hong Kong, everyone goes for dinner late. They're like, let's meet for dinner at 11 o'clock. Yes. And I normally go to bed at like nine, right? I'm like, okay. No. And, and we had some cocktails and I found myself speaking Cantonese and understanding it. I think it was the one and only time. My grandmother was probably looking down from heaven going, finally, she got it. She had to be drunk to do it, but she got it. Um, sidebar question, Mr. Bean or Blackadder? Oh, Blackadder, I think. Yeah. Blackadder. There was just, there was way more sarcasm in Blackadder. Um, so I was definitely a Blackadder fan. Yeah, that was a total sidebar. So one of the questions that came in on Good Instagram, one. thank you. I had to ask you that. Yeah. Um, I, every, every time I, um, someone goes to the UK, I, I'm like, will you bring me back a hello? Will you bring me back a grazia? Will you bring me back some lemon curd? Anyway, that's a, a whole side. So uh, <laughs> one of the questions that came from Instagram was, you know, you've been around some very, very successful people. Are there common traits of yes. those people? Yeah. Again, it's like the entrepreneur, you stick them all in a room and they're very, very similar because I actually went on a quest to find out how rich people thought, you know, how did they interact? How did successful people do things? How did successful people look at things? And I noticed a, come, a couple of things. One, they're all failures. Mm -hmm. Every single one of these people are failures and they look at that failure as education. They couldn't get to where they want to be without having those scrapes and those failures and mistakes to educate them as to what was necessary. And I noticed the first thing was that they allow the failure to refine them, not define them. Mm. So it's the entrepreneur, it's the intrapreneur, it's the amateur 
that goes, oh, I failed here. I'm stopping. And it's actually only a failure when you stop. When you learn from it and you grow, it's no longer a failure. It's an education. I noticed that, first of all. I also noticed the other thing. They didn't really care what you thought. And I was doing an event in SpaceX with Elon Musk. And one of the clients that I was with actually said to Elon, how do you feel? And this was before NASA took on Elon to basically build everything. Because without Elon, there would be none of the missions that's going on now. That's the bottom line of it. But I remember they asked the question at the time, how do you feel about NASA always kind of like mocking you and posting these different things? And at the time he turned around and he said, they will always laugh at you before they applaud. Mm. So he was prepared. He was prepared to be ridiculed. He was prepared to be stared at, jeered, laughed at. He was prepared for all of that. And he did not care because he was on a mission to succeed. And that was nothing more than just the journey. Mm. The, well, I'm grateful to Elon because thanks to him, my portfolio looks really good. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you a question. There's a famous story where several years ago, Elon um, wants to get a meeting with Tim Cook because he wants to sell Tesla. And Tim Cook won't take the meeting. In your opinion, having worked with Elon, what do you feel made him say, I'm not quitting? What makes him unique? Why is he a unicorn in the space? Because a lot of people would have said, I want to sell this company. Tim Cook won't take a meeting with me, but he went back and he, he went stronger into DevOps. He got more focused. Why is that? Got more into debt. You know, he was, he was borderline, borderline bankrupt a few times. Um, he refined what the goal was. Mm. You see, sometimes people will look at a business and go, hey, I want to be rich. Well, what is rich? You know, if you're living in Wyoming, you can be rich with 400 grand. If you're living in Manhattan, you're broke with 400 grand. So what is rich? What is successful? What is wealth? These are all goalposts that are very fluid. Um, and so I think what a lot of people do is they don't identify their goals very well. The beautiful thing about Elon, and I'm, I'm glad to, I've worked with Tim Cook, I'm glad that that never happened, okay? Uh, Tim's a fantastic guy, but Elon needed to be the one pushing it. Um, Elon redefined his goals. He redefined what he stood for, and he gained clarity through that. And I think that's the one of the, 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 guiding, the guiding stars of a lot of entrepreneurs. They, they find out where that true north is. They lock and load. And then they have ignorance. Yeah. Now, my wife actually said to me years ago, and this, this, is, this is a silly story, but um, with permission, I'll tell you it. <laughs> I had a dinner party here in Los Angeles. And at the dinner party were two of the uh, lead characters from the Marvel movies at the time. And it was a really cool party. I, you know, I, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a businessman, I was looking at that table going, my God, I can't believe the people that have come up. We only had about 14 people at the table. But one of the characters from Marvel turned around and said, hey, let's play a game. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Now, it started on that side of the table and then got to me. And I was like the eighth person to, to get asked this question. I'm trying to think of something clever, like the, the ability to, you know, to you know, get rid of poverty or to get people with vision or force. I was trying to think of something that would make me sound smarter than I am. And I'm not very good at that. When it got to me and they went, Hey Steve, so superpower, what is it? I'm like, well, you know, it's funny. You should say my wife piped up and she went, Oh, that's easy. It's ignorance. Now she said that. And I looked at her and I'm thinking I'm getting divorced in the morning. You know, you've just called me ignorant in front of all of these people that I admire that are now friends, peers, icon. You know, this is not good timing, Claire. And they were all on the table, and they could sense something. And she must have picked up on it. And she went, no, no, hold on a minute. She said, Steve goes into everything ignorant to the ability that it's going to fail, ignorant to the fact that they could possibly say no to him. Ignorant to the fact that it will go in any other way 
than the one that he wants. And she said, let me ask you, you've known the guy for years. How many times has he pulled, you know, getting people married in the Vatican, closing down museums and having a dinner party at the feet of Michelangelo's David, having a drum lesson with Guns N' Roses, going down and seeing the Titanic. How many times has he pulled off something and you've sat there and gone, how the hell did he do that? He was ignorant to it not being achievable or mm -hmm. not being refused. So I believe that a lot of the people that I've dealt with and a lot of successful people, they have that vision, they have that goalpost, and then they're ignorant to everything else that is possibly on the peripheral that could get in the way. They just don't see it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So many people are locked in a box of their own creation. Mm. And, and what a, what a beautiful compliment your wife gave you. And thankfully you didn't, you know, get divorced. Right. Yeah. I'm very yeah. happy about that. <laughs> I, I have a colleague. So one of my, one of my things I do, I I'm a co-founder of an artificial intelligence company. And, um, one day, one of our business partner, who's a VP of an $86 billion company, he, he, we're in a room at this big conference room and it's me and it's all men. And uh, which never intimidates me. I used to be a men's maximum security prison guard. So we could have a whole bunch of stories about what it's like to deal with 300 pound people and, and calm them down. And, uh, and he looks at everyone and he said, you know why Susan's successful? And they look, go, why? And he said, because she's delusional. Mm. Yep. Because she doesn't believe that failure is an option. She's just delusional. And, and I, this brings me to the next question. I mean, there's so many things I want to ask you. Um, I've done speaking events with Tony Robbins on several occasions. One of the things Tony talks about is people should stop saying millionaires and billionaires in the same sentence. Yes, it's, a, it's the extra zeros, but they think differently. And you've been around millionaires, as you mentioned, celebrities that some celebrities, they might, you know, command very high dollars for performances, but they never reach the billion mark, right? What's the difference in your mind of a millionaire and a billionaire? I think it was the Carnegie family that said, that if you can count your money, you're not rich. Um, <laughs> and I, always, I always loved that line. And this obviously goes back in the uh, <laughs> Goes, but it was either the Carnegie family or the Rothschilds, but I think it was the Carnegie family that actually said that. Um, there are people that are fixated on richness or wealth, okay? And depending on, you know, how you want to term it, but a lot of people look at richness as money. How much money do I have in the bank account, okay? And then there are people that look on wealth, and that wealth can be, uh, potentially, it can be control in a good way. It can be security. It can be values. And it can be impact. Mm -hmm. So when you look at something, someone like Bill Gates, Bill Gates isn't looking for the amount of money in his bank account. He's looking at the impact he can create in the world and how he can steer the ship, how he can move an entire industry. Elon does the exact same thing. You know, Jeff Bezos is doing the same thing. You know, Google are doing this. They are all looking at how can I move the needle? How can I move the planet into a state of better? What impact can I do? Now they're looking at that. They're not looking at the bank account. The millionaire is looking at the bank account and then wanting to inform you that I made a million. I've got a million. I've got a multi-millionaire. The billionaire won't be able to tell you what money he's got into the account because he's not relevant. What's relevant is the impact that he's creating in the planet and in his world. It's so interesting you say that. I mean, obviously, you know, many billionaires. Um, I, I'm fortuitous to have a mentor who's, who is a billionaire and she just thinks that way. What impact, you know, she wakes up four in the morning. How can I serve? How can I serve? What impact can we make? And I, you know, I've thought about that question a lot, but no one has ever articulated it the way you just did. Well, so thank, thank you. you. Much. <laughs> so the I, I, switching gears for a moment, being known as, and, and Jay Abraham asked you a similar question, but being known for, you know, being this concierge to billionaires, yet you have a lot of passions, um, definitely, you know, a lot of varied interests. If you could be known for something else, maybe something you've never even said to anyone, what would you want it to be? Yeah. Um, 
I suppose one word would be un unapologetic. Mm. Um, <clears throat> you see, it's funny. People know me. People know me as different things. You know, I've got coaching clients that know me as as their coach. You know, I've got people that I do events with know me as a speaker. Um, it's kind of tough and almost maybe even disrespectful to try and pigeonhole yourself too much. Um, I arrogantly will say that my company launched the personal and private concierge industry. We started it in the early 90s and we were a paid membership private concierge. And you can look at me and go, well, look, you, you're a concierge. You're there to make rich people more interesting by giving them amazing access that they never could have thought about. I never wanted to be a concierge. I'm actually, funnily enough, not good with people. I am terrible at small talk. Absolutely appalling at it. And I don't suffer fools gladly. So I can't put up with what you watched on Netflix. I really don't care. What I wanted to do was I wanted to use the industry that I was in as a Trojan horse to get into your mindset because mm. I was a curious kid. And my wife jokes that I'm a 54-year-old, five-year-old. I'm still that Irish East London curious kid that wants to know how I can get in there. What's that door do? What's that button do? What is that? What if I push this? I'm still that person. And that's what I like to do. That's what I want to be. So if you want to coin me as, oh, he's a concierge, I'm not really caring about what your tagline is. Mm -hmm. I just want people to be able to go, that's him. What you see is what you get. And I don't care if I'm stood, if you bump into me and I'm stood next to Elton John or I'm at a biker bar in West Hollywood, you're not going to be confused by not meeting me. I'm the exact same person here, there, absolutely everywhere. If that works for you, good guns, let's make some magic happen. If it alienates or aggravates you and you, you want nothing to do with me, move on. But the worst species in the planet are the fence sitters. Those that can't quite make up their mind. I believe my personality, my direction, my bluntness, my transparency, and notice the word authentic was never used there because I hate that word. But my transparency makes me impossible to misunderstand. And therefore, people will either be on my side of the fence or nowhere near me. And that's what I want to be known for. Unapologetic. I love it. Let's let us reserve authentic for one thing. So my family does watch Bake Off. <laughs> and we're unapologetic about it. And um, when when Paul Hollywood says this is an authentically good sponge, we're going to give him grace. <laughs> 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 I just had to throw that out there. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, um, so Clubhouse, we uh, I, I just did a show. And uh, we we're talking about Clubhouse is very, you know, interesting um, discussion. And you did a, a fun post about Clubhouse. And, and it essentially said that just because you can host a room doesn't mean you should host a room. And Rob Moore, um, another Brit, he has a top 10 show in the UK. I just had him on my show. He was episode 199. And we we're talking about Clubhouse. You, know, you mentioned about this whole concept of authentic, but you also have a high BS meter. One of the things I've said often is that if you want to be successful, you've got to model success. And there are a lot of fake millionaires out there. Um, let's have that discussion. You know, you, you alluded to that. The people who are out there who are talking about success, but haven't been successful, what advice would you give to them? Because clearly there's an issue there. <laughs> so I was raised up and um, I know you're only 22, but you know, you, you, you also may remember this kind of time frame as well, but the pair of us were born and raised in a time where Instagram wasn't around to tell us how inadequate our life was. Now, what they've done is social platforms seem to be there to show off somebody else's 
you know, excellent filter skills or leaning up against something that they don't own. And I live in LA and there's an airport down the road, Burbank, where they actually rent out planes that you can do photo shoots and selfies on and the plane doesn't even leave the runway. So we're using all of these things to show off. And there was a funny story that I don't live with a lot of regret. I have very little regret, but I do regret this moment that I wasn't filming this. I was in Beverly Hills and I ride motorcycles. I don't drive cars. I'm on two wheels forever. So I had turned up at this place in Beverly Hills on a bike and they had shoved me right down in below to be able to park the bike. So I'd gone down there. I was just getting on the machine. And in the far corner of this car park was this beautiful Lamborghini. Okay. It was, it was gorgeous. Bright green, I think it was. Um, and I just remember seeing it. But why I really noticed it was there were these two guys and a cameraman with a light ring on them. And these two guys were going, hey, if you want a car like this, you need to be getting involved with that. And they started on this pitch. And I wish I had been taking a, a filming of it because these people were filming in the car park that, you know, how to be a millionaire course. All right. You know, good luck to them. They were making money any way they could. You know, I don't want to hate on it. You know, do whatever you need. If there's a sucker out there, eh, you're the one to blame. But then it made a twist to something that, my God, I wish I had caught on camera. As they are in their full flow of pitch of telling you why you need to pay attention to them and get involved in their online community, a voice came out of the stairwell and it was like, Oi, get off my eep car. And this like Ukrainian mobster went legging it across the. These two guys shot off this car and run up a different stairwell and boat went out. They were filming this video about how rich they were. On this dude's car. It was his... I couldn't get on the motorbike for about 10 minutes because I was crying. It was so funny. I just wish I'd recorded it. But there's so many people out there at the moment selling courses, gaining viewers, doing Instagram pages and, and TikTok, and all these other things, talking to you about influence and credibility and wealth when they have none of those things. And just because you look good on a bathing suit doesn't mean you can help my business get $10 million in funding. But people are doing it. And it's just, it's just, it's amazing to me. But I think COVID's actually removed a lot of it. You mm -hmm. see, I think COVID and 2020 has given us a, a heightened level of aggravation. We don't have as much tolerance in 2020 as we did in 2019. In 2019, someone said something that bothered us. We were like, uh, you know, walk away. Now we're pissed off. <laughs> we're being lied to. We, we're being locked in our, in our home. We can't go out and socialize. We can't go out and communicate. Everyone's feeding us whatever viewpoint they're... We don't have much tolerance at the moment. If something bothers us today, we react and we're annoyed. And we're getting very responsive to looking through and seeing through that fake, I can make you a millionaire by tea time kind of course mentality. And I think that's a good thing that we need to be getting it out of the way. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Another it's, time. Yeah, it's it's. I love that you said that because the world doesn't need any more pretenders. We all have gifts. I have a I have a client. She's in her 60s. She makes handmade chocolates in Vermont, and Ooh. she's really good at it. And her Instagram is all about her chocolates. Whatever you're good at, just put that out there in the world, right? And and that's the power of it. And anyone I've met who is wealthy, wealthy they're very interesting because they don't tend to be the ones, there are a few on Instagram who flaunt it, but they tend to be very quiet about it. And I guess my, um, one of my, I, there's so many things I want to ask you. I'm going to ask this fun question. We're going to keep it in. If you were Boris Johnson, what are three things you would do? <laughs> <laughs> I just well, wanted to ask this. So my I like, no, I like I'm quirky. So it's all yeah. Um, and there's probably a lot of people going, who the hell is Boris Johnson? Um, no, I we're think, our third biggest country. Um, oh, is, right, okay. All right. Um, 
Being being a Brit in America, I would have to say I would give him the first piece of advice that I would give Donald Trump as well, and get a haircut that's not embarrassing. That would be the the, the first thing I would do. I kind of find it funny that Boris has the hair he does and seems to be wearing suits that he got from you know someone else's wardrobe. Uh, it just Marks and Sparks discount basement. Yes. He, yeah, but he got the disc, <laughs> he got the discount rack from a different size as well. So I just can't help thinking that some of these people don't have friends because I know if I went out in something that looked bad, my wife would be like, "Are you are you serious? You know, are you really going out?" Some of these people don't have that. So I think I think some of these people need friends that actually tell them the truth and to stop blowing smoke up their backside. <laughs> well, on the, know, on the note about the planes, you were saying about I, I was in Palm Beach and a client of mine, um, he had this private jet and we were going off somewhere. And there was someone that he was bringing along with him that she straight away got the camera out to take a picture of her on, a, on this jet. And he put his hand over the, the phone and went, No, 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 we don't do that, love. And he turned around and he said, People that own private jets have never taken a selfie on them. Yes. And I was like, that is gold. That is gold. So I really like that. Because when you become very wealthy, you're about protecting your wealth. And look at Sam Walton driving around in his pickup truck. I'm sure you know billionaires who most people, they don't even know their names, right? Oh, but did you know the funny thing is a lot of people, a lot like my book, um, my book has a, um, a testimonial on the back by Sir Elton John. And so a lot of people go, wow, you know Sir Elton John, you know Elon Musk, you know Richard Branson. Most of my clients are actually way wealthier than that, okay? And you never know, never know who they are. I used to work for the Sir Elton John Oscar party, and I was there for like eight years, and I'd have about three tables in that place. So I would have anywhere up to 60 to 80 people go to Elton John's party. And there'd be a couple of like TV stars or rock stars or you know, business moguls that would turn up. But for about 60 of like 70 people, you'd have no idea who they are. They just own things like oil tycoons or countries. And you just had, or they owned banking empires. You had no idea who they were. And they could not only buy the table, they could buy the park, they could buy the city that we were in. And no one knew who they were. And it was hysterical. That is awesome. <laughs> and so it, the, anyone I know with a plane that, and I, if I've gone with them, we never take photos on the plane. And oh. one of the things I always say is most of my life is not lived on Instagram. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah it's kind of ridiculous. I actually, I, I spoke in, um, I used to live in Thailand and one of the things that we never got to do was my wife always wanted to play around with elephants and we never got the chance to do it when we were there. So I always said, next time we're over that end of town, we'll go up to Chiang Mai and we'll go and play with the elephants. Mm -hmm. And luckily I had a speaking engagement in Phuket. So I said to her, come with me. We'll go back to Bangkok, which was where we lived for a few years. And we go up to Chiang Mai and play with the elephants. Now these elephants, they loved my wife because apparently elephants look at you like kittens. And so <laughs> they play with you. Um, but I don't think this elephant liked me. And so I kind of stayed away from it. And I was uh, the camera. I was only there for Claire. So I didn't really care about it. But at one stage, they said, look, get a photograph. So I got this, uh, got this picture with this elephant. And what I did was I thought, I've got to post it. But I've got to post it in a way that it kind of takes the, takes the piss out of what I'm saying. So I posted this picture with me, literally with my hand on the trunk, like I'm leaning up against this elephant going, no, I don't own this elephant like you don't own that sports car. <laughs> and I posted that and I actually got some, and I'm doing air quotes here, <laughs> influencers that contacted me and said, that kind of quote isn't helpful for us. And I'm like, please behave, you know? So, you know, I, I, I'm aware that I have some people out there that are not too happy with um, the way I frame things. I love the way you frame things because it's direct. <laughs> And it's, it's awesome. I'm, I'm going to ask one last question. It's not related to anything. If you were on Bake Off, <laughs> what, what would they ask you to bake that would make you sweat? And if you're listening and you don't know what Bake Off is, I apologize. Oh, I'm talking about fabulous. the Great British Bake Off. 
Um, what would they ask you to bake that would make you sweat? I think basically anything other than toast. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty damn appalling. Um, I always joked that, you know, you get these um, programs where they give you all the secret ingredients. <laughs> well, I would do a scramble for anything. No matter what they gave me, I'd just mix it in egg, stick it on toast, and that would be, it'd be scramble with like, you know, eels or, you know, whatever. I'd just scramble the bloody thing because the only thing I can do above toast is scramble and sear up a damn good steak. But I really, I like to barbecue. Do you know, it's funny. As men, we can't cook, but the second we buy a barbecue, we think we're brilliant. Have you ever noticed that? It's <laughs> weird. So I can burn the ass out of absolutely anything, but um, no, keep me away from a kitchen because I can't cook. Okay, so Paul Hollywood, should you be listening? Don't invite Steve Sims to be in the tent. That's just what we have to say. Oh, yeah. Maybe Claire, maybe his wife. Yes. I don't know if she's, yes, yes. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> I, I had, I'm turning 50 um, soon. And um, so I, every guest lately I'm asking them. So I've decided, I had Jesse Itzler on my show and Jesse was turning 50 and he said he was going to learn 50 new things. So I've decided to have 50 new experiences. So what is an experience that you think I should have for my 50th year? Oh, straight. So I'll tell you a little story that will answer that and I'll make it quick. But um, years and years, I've been with my wife for like 35 years. And in the, early, in the early years of my life, we obviously never had any money. And like a typical young teenage lad, there were some times I wasn't exactly the most thoughtful guy on the planet. And I forgot her birthday all right. And I got in trouble. Who wouldn't? So the following year, I took control of that mistake and made a point of not getting her a present. But we went and did something. So I created an experience. Following that very early on, she's never received a birthday present from me. If she wants to buy something, she can buy it herself. It's her money. But every birthday, I give her an experience. This year was her 53rd. And she likes driving things. So I've had her drive in Porsche race cars. I've had her drive in um, uh, um, drift cars, rally cars. And this year I actually had her sent in to do a bulldozer driving course where she actually drove a bulldozer through a building site and did all of these things. But for her 50th, I wanted to do something that she hadn't done before. And I said to her, as it's your birthday, now bear in mind, I've been doing this for 30 years. She's leapt out of planes. She's done unarmed combat with Krav Maga. She's uh, gone shooting with Navy SEALs. And she doesn't, she doesn't want to do exciting things, but anything she's ever said, oh, I'd like to do that, I've made a note of. So I said to her, because it's your 50th, I don't want to do what you don't want to do or that may kind of scare you or, you know, get you messy or whatever. So what would you like to do? This will be the only year you get a choice. She said, all I want to do is go and have um, sushi with my family. She loves sushi. Sushi with my family. I went, all right, can I pick the sushi restaurant? Could I find a new one that we haven't tried before? But I'm, I'm not going to surprise you. I'm just going to give you what you want this year. And she went, yes, you could pick the restaurant. So I went, great. So on her birthday, which is in December, we had the kids come in the room and they gave her um, three envelopes. The first envelope said, um, tomorrow night, we're going to eat sushi at this sushi restaurant. It's the best in the area. She was like, oh, that's lovely, brilliant. We gave <laughs> her a second envelope. And we said, look, you know we were going to surprise you. We couldn't let it go. We had to do something that was a bit quirky. She's like, yeah, what is it? I said, the following day, we're going to learn how to make sushi. So we're actually going to do a family sushi making um, lesson the following day. So your birthday is spread out over a few days with a couple of different things. And she's like, oh, that's fantastic. I love it. Brilliant. And then we gave her the third card, which actually gave her six hours to get packed because we were doing all of this in Tokyo. <laughs> so, so what we did was we flew her out there. We did uh, um, sushi, sushi making. We went in the fish market. And then one of the highlights was we actually got taught to uh, fight, uh, fight a sword fight with a samurai, with an actual member of a samurai family. So I think what you should do for your 50th, and I maybe have a reverse, for one, be thankful it's your 50th. Yeah. 
you've got to enter your 50th with immense gratification that you've hit this and you, and I've only known you for a short time, but you're in control of this arrival. You got yourself here. So pour your favorite drink, whether it be that British tea you love and just go, I'm here because I put myself here. So revel in your 50th of gratification, self-gratification, and then maybe do something that is challenging or maybe even scares you a little bit. I, I love that. And you know what? Driving a bulldozer, my mind, I just couldn't stop thinking about that. I'm like, I want to drive a bulldozer. So that was my Jerry Maguire, Maguire moment. I'm like, you had me at bulldozer. <laughs> I can't even speak. I'm like, I want to drive a bulldozer. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, it has been an absolute honor to chat with you. And I know I could ask you so many things. I would love for everyone to connect with you at stevedsims.com. Sims with one M, the proper way, mind you. And um, on Instagram, oh my gosh, hilarious. And uh, <laughs> and thank you for everything you provide. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to read your book, Blue Fishing. And um, if, you know, if you're one of the things we know in all the studies of self-made millionaires, they read two books a month. And if you haven't picked your two books this month, get that book. Um, I know I'm excited to read it. And uh, again, thanks for being here. I truly appreciate it. I had fun. Thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. And so if this has been a great episode, which it has, um, Steve and I like to ask for what we want. We want a five-star review. Please go ahead and share this on social media. If you have any comments about the British Bake Off or you don't think Black Adder is better than Mr. Bean, go ahead and comment on my social media at Susan Sly. Um, I'll be happy to talk to you about why Black Adder is better than Mr. Bean. But with that, God bless, go rock your day, and we'll see you in a future episode. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another epic episode of the Susan Sly Project. For more tips, strategies, and ideas, visit www.susansly.com. <laughs>